So on the, on the subject of the PMC, um, I think what I want to talk about is the PMC during the pandemic. Um, and I think, I think before I, you know, totally dive in, it's helpful to revisit some of what Barbara Ehrenreich and John Ehrenreich talked about in their 2013 essay, Death of a Yuppie Dream. Um, and I think Catherine might touch on this as well later. Um, but uh, this was this was something that they wrote a little after the Occupy Wall Street era, while the country was still really in the throes of the Great Recession. And in this essay, the Ehrenreichs argue that the professional managerial class is near its end. So, so they're basically saying the PMC is basically on its way out. And they talk about how the PMC has been fractured by decades of technological changes, uh, job outsourcing, attacks on labor. So essentially the same conditions that, uh, that the working class has always faced. But from the 1970s onward, the Ehrenreichs argue that the PMC is increasingly subject to these forces as well. So they then argue that as a result, the members of the PMC um, they're basically either peeling off to join this sort of super elite tier of massively wealthy CEOs and super managers. And then on the lower end, the PMC uh, is suffering the collapse of many of their professions, as Ariella mentioned earlier. Um, that includes the decline of newspaper journalism to the elimination of tenured academic jobs. Um, so in other words, the lower half of the PMC is increasingly becoming proletarianized. So, so the Ehrenreichs, you know, they they look at all of this and they argue that the remaining members of the PMC basically have a choice now. Um, they can join with the traditional working class to fight against capitalism, or they can resign themselves essentially to the dustbin of history, right? And the Ehrenreichs conclude their essay by writing, in the coming years, we expect to see the remnants of the PMC increasingly making common cause with the remnants of the traditional working class for, at a minimum, representation in the political process. This is the project that the Occupy movement initiated and spread, for a time anyway, worldwide. And I think if you graduated into the Great Recession, which I did, um, or if you had you know, any involvement or interest in Occupy, I think a lot of the Ehrenreich's assessment really does ring true, right? Um, I mean, you know, the majority of participants of Occupy were college grads uh, who were experiencing this massive student debt, unemployment, and downward mobility, particularly in the economic downturn. And I think that Occupy's, uh, you know, language of we are the 99% uh, really does reflect its participants' um, it, it, it reflects how its participants sort of saw themselves as part of the exploited masses. And in many senses, they were, right? Uh, but if we jump forward to the current economic recession and you know the pandemic that's going on right now, um, I think it's becoming harder in some ways to argue that the only fault line is between the 1% and the 99%. So to be fair, all of the trends that the Ehrenreichs identified in 2013, I think, you know, are still going strong. Um, and when we think about who's actually done well during the pandemic, obviously still the top 1%, still the top 0.01%. Um, I mean, I think billionaires, you know, collectively grew their wealth by over a trillion dollars just during the pandemic alone. But that said, uh, it's also the case that the top 20 to 25% of income earners, uh, which again is a large chunk of the professional managerial class, um, these people have basically all but recovered from the pandemic economic crash, um, or they weren't really affected much by it to begin with. So if we look at this chart from the Washington Post, um, you can really see how the, the economic recovery for the top 25% of earners compares to the lowest earners for the last couple of recessions. And, you know, if you look at the coronavirus crisis uh, segment, uh, you can see that for this one, jobs held by the top income earners have essentially already all returned. And that's just not the case at all for the lowest earners. So just to drive that home, I want to read a quote from the Washington Post article. They write, by the end of the summer, the downturn was largely over for the wealthy. White collar jobs had mostly rebounded along with home values and stock prices. The shift to remote work strongly favored more educated workers with as many as six in 10 college educated employees working from home at the outset of the crisis compared with about one in seven who only have high school diplomas. 
So the point here, you know, is is of course not that the PMC is doing as well as the billionaires, but that their relative stability and safety, I think, helps explain some of their behavior that we saw during the pandemic. So one example is, um, you know, we saw large segments of the PMC sort of immediately plunge headlong into what we might call the coronavirus culture wars. So you, you saw people elevating all of these anti-Trump blue state governors like Andrew Cuomo, um, even though, of course, New York's death toll is higher than any other states as a direct result of Cuomo failing to take measures um, to contain outbreaks early on in the pandemic. And also, um, this is a product of his years of pushing through austerity policies like budget cuts and hospital closures. Um, but I think the most striking example of the PMC's unique position during this pandemic was actually displayed through their attitudes towards other workers. So, you know, on one hand, in the early days of lockdowns, um, we saw all of these white collar workers in New York kind of making a show of clapping and applauding nightly from their windows for essential workers going to work. Uh, now, this is a gesture that, of course, like, I don't think you can deny is incredibly well intentioned. Um, but, you know, it also sometimes felt a little thin or even self congratulatory. And, and in addition to that, you know, despite this symbolic show of solidarity, by the end of the summer, members of the PMC, and in particular, the liberal commentariat, they really begin pressing for the reopening of schools explicitly against the wishes of public school teachers and their unions. So we have these supposedly progressive columnists in the Washington Post, uh, the New York Times, and other outlets um, who, you know, essentially joined Donald Trump in calling for schools to reopen in the fall. And they argue that, quote, the science had proven that schools were not major super spreaders. Now, like I said, in doing so, this group of liberals really positioned themselves against teachers across the country who, you know, repeatedly raised concerns that after decades of disinvestment, their classrooms were just not ready for in-person learning during during the pandemic. Um, you, you hear teachers saying that school buildings aren't well ventilated, uh, that schools are not properly staffed with enough nurses or other medical personnel. And a lot of teachers really worried that there would just be a shortage of um, personal protective equipment, which I think is a, is a very fair worry. Um, and then despite that, uh, the PMC continues saying, well, no, we should reopen schools. Um, and this doesn't really come as much as a, of a surprise, but lots of people also say, well, remote learning is disproportionately hurting black and brown children, right? Um, and, you know, this is probably true to some degree, but at the same time, we also have tons of polls that show that low income parents and black and brown parents disproportionately do not want to send their kids back to school during an active pandemic. And then on top of all that, a few months later, um, the science that the PMC claims to love so much actually now suggests that schools could be serious sites of transmission. So we have um, a couple new high quality studies that show that when, trans when community transmission is low, reopening school buildings is not much of a risk. In that context, it's fine. But when community transmission is higher, such as in the large coastal cities where the media class tends to live, schools likely do play a role in transmission. Um, and we also had another study uh, just from last month that found that reopening schools in Florida led to increased rates of infection among students. And again, like, just to reiterate, this whole time, public school teachers and their unions have been fighting to keep schools remote. Um, even right now, actually, the Chicago Teachers Union is um, currently considering a strike, given that Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot is once again pushing to reopen schools, even though vaccines are not yet widely available. So I, I just want to return to the Aaron Reich's prediction that the PMC could make common cause with the working class, um, because I think I think the Aaron Reichs correctly diagnosed the problems facing the PMC, and they also correctly judged the mood of the PMC during the last recession, but. I guess nearly a decade later, and especially during this new downturn, um, I'm, I'm not sure that the signs are so great. Um, and, and hopefully Catherine will elaborate more on this. Um, you know, obviously the pandemic has made it clear how much we need massive public investment. Uh, we need policies like universal health care and a federal jobs program. And for the most part, I don't see many signs that the majority of the PMC today um, is getting on board with that. I don't see that they are invested in the expansion of public goods or the types of universal programs that can transfer power to working people. Um, so like I said, I, Catherine's going to talk about this in much more detail, um, so I won't say too much more here. So I'll wrap up and hand it over to you, Ariella. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's really been fascinating to see the way these fissures come out. Like, you know, we talked about the kind of culture war aspect of the coronavirus, mask shaming, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems like a hallmark, maybe not just of, of the PMC, but it seems that they tend to individualize these mm -hmm. crises, mm -hmm. right? Instead of viewing it as a broad issue, it's like, my kid's going to fall behind. Mm -hmm. And maybe my kid's like all those black and brown kids. And what if it's even worse for them? But, <laughs> Right. Know. No, totally. Yeah, with the mask shaming um, or, you know, the, the kind of like push that like individuals should social distance. I mean, that's all true. You know, like wear your mask mask and like practice social distancing and, you know, like don't go to bars or whatever. Um, but I, I do feel that the focus really was on kind of these individual issues. I mean, how can you glorify Cuomo who, you know, caused hundreds of thousands of deaths? Yeah. Um, the Cuomo sexual shirts are just egregious, egregious. I I almost like wanted to play a video clip of Ellen DeGeneres talking about being a Cuomo sexual, but She's I was canceled like, on the Jacobin channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, it's too, it's too much. It's too much. No one, no one wants to see that. So, <laughs> yeah, you know that aspect of things that the way that it becomes hyper individualized. It's this um, coming to terms with, in a way, the what they feel is the futility of collective action, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it accepts that and then it says, well, I'm going to strive to be the most competitive mm -hmm. in a world where collective action is not possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's that's one of the ways that it becomes the most clear how they're antagonistic towards the working class, towards the universal programs and towards the demands of you know, most people mm -hmm. who can't. And sorry, I was gonna say they can't actually afford the time and the energy to gather up the information and, and skirt their way through to get on top of the pile. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention quickly that the reason why I brought up, uh, you know, this segment of the PMC kind of pivoting on reopening the schools is because all of those people were like super locked down, like super pro mm -hmm. lockdown, like close everything down until I think they had to spend a little too much time <laughs> With their children. <laughs> With their children. Um, yeah. And then and then suddenly it was like, oh, well, all the science says that we have to, you know, reopen the schools. Um, and like I said, it was uh, it was I think the thing that like really got to me was that it was just so hostile to teachers unions. I mean, yeah. I think that there was a, a headline on the um, collage that Kale put together where, you know, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, teachers share the blame. Yes. Yes. It was like teachers yeah. unions. Teachers unions share the blame. Yeah. Yeah. 